Today's module will focus on molecular breeding or the application of molecular tools for improvement of plant varieties. So in this module we have two basic concepts. The first one is marker assisted selection and the second concept is molecular breeding to improve plants by using genetic engineering tools. So we will introduce you to the concepts of these two processes. Okay. If you view the history of crop domestication, you will note that farmers have spent thousands of years developing the crops which we consume today. For instance, rice has been developed over thousands of years. Corn was developed by the Mayan civilization and the Aztecs in South America from a grass which was called teosinte. So teosinte looks nothing like corn. It's just a grass with few kernels, but the breeders, ancient breeders, learned to inbreed and develop new varieties. So they, they uh, even though they were not aware of molecular tools and molecular processes, they still had the basic knowledge of breeding. So one of the key uh, concepts which they use is back crossing. So you take two parental genotypes, you cross them, you then get progeny and then you cross the progeny with the parent and you continue this process until the process of introgression occurs. Introgression means a significant number of genes from the parental genotypes are incorporated in the progeny. Okay, so this is a process known as back crossing and back crossing uh, leads to increased level of heterosis or in this case of teosinte, it may have led to the increased gene dosage which leads to better kernels of corn. So this was done over thousands of years. So if you look from the context of sustainability, as the population size increased, breeding techniques had to keep up with the increase in population because it has to sustain the community. So the agrarian community, if you refer to agrarian communities like Aztecs and Mayans, their whole economy is driven by agriculture. Now we are living in a trade-based economy in which our economy is driven by trade. But in the earlier days you had an agrarian economy. So early breeders used to try to ensure that they could obtain more yield per hectare. That was their aim. And then they developed new, newer hybrids which we are using until today. Today we are faced with a problem. We have a growing population and reduced acreage. The amount of land required to sustain a human being or a family of five is around one hectare. You require a hectare of land, 10,000 square meters to grow sufficient crops for a family of five to meet their calorific requirements. However, the acreage is reducing because of development and urbanization. And there is another problem which we face which is pollution. Okay? Pollution is eating up into a lot of our acreage and we have to now find new tools for breeding. So the earlier breeding processes required a significant amount of time. For instance, rice, you can obtain like two breeding cycles to three breeding cycles in a calendar year. You can breed. However, if you want to develop new varieties, you have to develop them over maybe 16, 17 or maybe 50 breeding cycles. So you need to wait for the plant to flower, pollinate it in a controlled manner and develop your seeds. Then you need to breed those seeds and back cross and so on and so forth. So this process takes a lot of time. Today with marker assisted selection, which is basically the application of PCR based markers for the selection of traits. We can speed up this process, which uh, results in a significant reduction of the time from the breeding plot to the commercial plant. So marker estrid selection is basically a tool to reduce the time or the duration from breeding to commercialization. That's one process. The second process which we have is molecular breeding, which is the introduction of specific traits via genetic engineering. Now some traits may be controlled by a single gene. 
some traits or most traits are polygenic which means they are com controlled by multiple genes so genetic engineering offers an avenue to transform a single trait via the introduction of a single gene or via multiple genes okay. so i will teach you the concept of how this is done over the course of this lecture okay most open pollinated varieties of plants are indeterminate hybrids which means that the plant is growing in the field and the pollen can come in from anywhere and pollinate the plant so these varieties are known as indeterminate hybrids so indeterminate hybrids are very good in terms of diversity okay for instance you get diversity of rice locally it's all because of the result it's the end product of cross breeding which is not controlled so you get diversity however a modern farmer does not want diversity he needs to harvest a crop within a given period of time so if you have a plot of land of 1 hectare and you have six different varieties which will for example they will be ready or ripen at different times it's going to be economically challenging for the farmer because he has to do different harvesting cycles so the aim of breeders is to develop consistency so if they give you a variety for instance a hybrid determinate hybrid x this determinate hybrid will be ready for harvesting within a period of 121 days so it follows through from that so they want consistency however if we are too consistent in terms of breeding if we inbreed too much we open up the avenue for diseases because the plants are basically derived from a monoculture so in this case we need to again resort to diversity based breeding so that's the challenge so we need to have a certain varieties of crops which are uniform and have uniform characteristics so it makes it easier for the farmer to cultivate however we need to maintain germplasm which is diversified so in the case of a how uh, in case of a infection for instance from you have rice blast we should have varieties which are tolerant to this disease as well so these are the challenges for breeders so this this in, this slide introduces you to the key concepts which are determinate and indeterminate so in today's uh, commercial breeding industry most seeds are the end result of determinate breeding so they are hybrid determinate hybrids and they are far more expensive as compared to indeterminate hybrids okay as you know in plants some traits are discrete and some traits are continuous for instance you cross a plant with red flowers and white flowers you may get a progeny or f1 hybrid which has variations of the color we'll have pinks or magenta or different variations of red and white so this kind of trait is referred to as continuous so these are continuous traits this is because in the case of flowers the color is determined by pigments known as anthocyanins so these anthocyanins are, are regulated by certain genes the production of anthocyanins is regulated by specific genetic pathways so when you develop hybrids there is a likelihood that this uh, gene composition is actually a hybrid of the two genetic pathways and then you will have variations in color so these kinds of traits are continuous means you'll get a variation from pink to variations of pink until it becomes red okay that's continuous discrete traits are distinct for instance you cross a plant with red flowers and a plant with white flowers and your progeny will either be red or white and nothing in between so that's a discrete trait they are discrete they have discrete functions okay now most breeders when they develop markers like to focus on loci which encode discrete traits because one locus one trait however we always face the dilemma of continuous traits and as most of the genes are regulated by environment you will have continuous traits for instance flower color 
may be regulated by the pH of the petal. Okay, so these factors come into play. So in today's industry, floriculture, for instance, plays a significant. Uh, it has a significant contribution to the economics of the plant industry, for instance, floriculture. So, breeders try to develop flower variations based on continuous traits as opposed to discrete traits. One classic example is the Phalaenopsis orchid. So, you have the Phalaenopsis amabilis, which is a white flower, and then you can cross breed other colors into the white and you get variations of white, and this forms the basis of the orchid industry in places like tai Taiwan, which has a diversity of Phalaenopsis hybrids. Another key concept which breeders have to take into account is linkage, this equilibrium. Sometimes two loci are linked very tightly. It is likely that they are located on the same arm of the same chromosome. And when the chromosome undergoes genetic recombination and homologous crossover, there will be no transfer or separation of these two traits. Okay? So these traits are tightly linked together. Some traits are not tightly linked together. When a chromosome undergoes homologous recombination, these traits may be lost or spread out onto two different chromosomes. Now this is a challenge to breeder because sometimes you may want two traits. For instance, you want a variety of rice which is high yielding, N is drought tolerant, two, two traits. Okay, So you genetically engineer these two traits onto a single chromosome. However, during the process of crossbreeding, these traits are lost because they get separated during the process of recombination. So these things are key things which drive the process of developing breeding programs, the key concepts which drive your breeding program. Okay, so this is a depiction of the two approaches. So you have the approach A in which you cross an elite variety. A elite variety is a variety which has been developed over successive breeding cycles. For instance, an elite variety of rice. Now, when a breeder has an elite variety in his repository, he may want to improve that elite variety. Okay? So, in order to improve that elite variety, he will cross it with a wild variety which has a desired characteristic. For instance, your elite variety has a high yield with regard to rice, high yielding rice. However, it cannot tolerate drought. So, the breeder travels to a region which is drought prone and then he brings in a variety which is drought tolerant and then he crosses these two varieties. So when he crosses these two varieties, he obtains a hybrid which has the characteristic of drought tolerance as well as high yield. He crossed it. However, the wild variety also carries many undesirable genes from the wild type. It may result in a rice variety which has lower yield or maybe more prone to certain diseases. So he has to basically water down or reduce the impact of this wild variety. So what they do is they basically cross with the recurrent parent, which means that you cross your F1 hybrid in that case, which is with the elite variety over subsequent generations until those traits of the wild species are watered down or reduced. Okay, That's how the concept works in breeding. Now, genetic engineers argue for the second method, which is listed as B, in which case they say there's no need to find a wild variety and cross it over. All you need to do is identify the genes from the wild variety, develop a gene construct, transform it into the elite variety and obtain a new strain which is far more easier to do in terms of time. However, in terms of technicality, it's challenging. So we have this dichotomy of approaches. In the first approach, time is a constraint. In the second approach, technical challenges of genetic engineering. Okay, so this is another concept which is linkage drag. 
And it comes down to the same example of an elite variety and a wild variety. When you cross an elite and a wild variety, certain number of genes will carry over into the F1 hybrid. So these genes and this concept is basically termed as linkage drag. It's a linkage to, of the uh, desired genes in the wild variety with the undesired genes. Okay, so they are linked together. So when you transform or you create a hybrid, you transfer these linked genes. And these need to be watered down, but they need to be diluted out over successive breeding cycles. So that term is referred to as linkage drag. The another aspect is epistasis. For instance, you transfer a gene which carries a certain trait into a plant using genetic engineering. There is a likelihood that the product of that gene, which may be a protein or it may be an enzyme which is involved in a specific pathway, interacts with another enzyme or another gene product from the plant. So in this case, you will have epistasis or the interaction of two gene products. Now this is more highly likely to happen in a complex eukaryotic system. However, we have no control over this. Okay, we have no control over what will happen to the gene, the fate of the gene once it's introduced in the plant. Most likely it will interact with other products or other gene products and that's where epistasis comes in, the concept of epistasis, where you have interaction of two gene products resulting in a phenotype which is not the one which was desired or less than what was desired. Okay. So which comes down to the three forces which drive the evolution of the genome. You have mutation in the genome which can occur in situ as a result of environmental factors. You have migration when you basically breed two varieties, you have migration. And then the third one is genetic drift. Okay, so mutation, migration and drift drive the evolution of natural populations. However, when we are breed, breeding it in a controlled environment, we have control over these factors. For instance, we can control mutation. Okay, we can control the level of mutation by increasing the level of mutagens. We can increase the level of muta mutation. As I explained earlier, a large number of crop varieties available in today's commercial environment are developed using mutation. They use yeah, chemicals such as colchicine, ethyl methane sulfonate to improve or uh, develop variants of the plant. So we have control over mutation. Migration, we also have control over migration because we can get new hybrids from different parts of the world or new varieties, wild types and cross them with our hybrids. Okay. And then you have drift. Uh, genetic drift is basically the result of fixation of genes and loss of their functionality over time. Okay, so this one is more difficult to control. Okay, in the earlier environments, breeders used to bring plants from different parts of the world and breed them together. Okay, we had no quarantine laws. Today we are restricted by quarantine laws. Okay, so you, for instance, you have Borneo, then you have Kalimantan, Sabah, and you have Philippines and Indonesia. So earlier there was no boundary as we see it today. So there was a cross exchange of germplasm. Today everything is restricted by quarantine laws which is, have been put into place basically for the benefit of the industry because if you have crops which are carrying diseases transferred over boundaries, you are likely to have widespread destruction of the economics of agriculture. Okay, so these are the key concepts which we go into. So we have population development, which is basically developing uh, breeding population. So breeding companies, commercial breeding companies, they invest a large amount of money into developing breeding populations. Okay, So this forms their germplasm or germ pool. And these will be maintained in greenhouses which are climate controlled because they are like your bank account. They drive your industry. So you'll have greenhouses which are housing wild varieties and elite varieties. And breeders are constantly bio-prospecting for new varieties of rice. They go to, maybe there's a pocket in Sabah in which they have a unique variety of rice which has never been grown outside that village or that small pocket. 
So breeders will be very interested in acquiring that young plasm. However, under today's regulatory framework, all these endemic varieties are controlled by certain acts like the Biodiversity Act. Okay, so we just can't go and pick plants from anywhere and transfer them. Of course, people do it illegally, but it's not correct. It's against the law. Okay, so that's about population development. The second thing is QTL mapping. So QTLs are quantitative trait loci. So the concept of QTL is very clear. It's basically a locus in plants. It represents a cluster of genes or a single gene which encodes certain desirable traits. So quantitative trait loci is a locus or a region of the genome which you can quantify. And how you do it is by using PCR. So for instance, you cross two parental genotypes. Then you want you take the seeds from that, you get the F1 hybrids, and then you plant them, and then you assess them for the parental genotype based on the inheritance pattern using PCR. It's a straightforward procedure. Okay, after you do quantitative trait locus mapping, you can do validation and marker acid selection. Okay. So what you need to do is first identify all the known traits in plants. You have, a, for instance, you have rice, drought tolerant, salt tolerant, pesticide resistant, you have this or weed side, herbicide resistant, right? So you grow all of them together and then you screen their genomes for specific genes. Okay, you know your clusters of genes and then you link these genes to specific traits. One of the ways you can do it is by knocking out the gene. So you have a gene knockout of that plant and you test, does this gene uh, control this specific trait. Okay, When I knocked out this gene, will it, for instance, lose drought tolerance? And on this basis, you can develop your quantitative trait loci. 